questions. Has anybody got an urn at home to lend us for tomorrow, sir? Because what I was thinking, ah, but I was thinking that during a break, if we could have an urn, people could uh, help themselves to coffee or tea, you know, and we get these polyesterine cups. Yeah, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Will you bring your urn tomorrow? Yeah, it would be nice if I could. I'm sure there must be plugs in the passage. We can put a table out there. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, right. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Good, shall we just meditate for a few moments to settle down? <laughs> Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And open your eyes slowly. comfortable? There are plenty of chairs if you want one. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Now let me hear some of your deep, profound, philosophical, metaphysical questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. I think it's less a question than it, than it is a request, actually. But, mm. uh, it seems in um, our modern culture, we're besieged by the subconscious or the subliminal areas of human experience. And it's rare in my experience that I've heard anyone even use the word superconsciousness and, and transcendence is used often in distorted terms. Um, I wonder if you might speak of what you refer to as a super. Aha, very good. Very good indeed. Fine. Uh, did you? Uh, oh, please do. Yes, you can give. I could handle half a dozen at the same time. And uh, what I'm wondering if you were to do with speak as well, what would be certainly the most singular and important aspect of Sarma for households? Uh huh. Beautiful. Very good. It combines with this question. Huh? Well, I could relate that one. Um, the use of uh, 
creative energy or sexual energy and awakening of Kundalini and how that relates to spiritual growth and so on. What do you want sexual energy for? Oh, it relates to sexual Kundalini awakening. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> Good. Um, the human mind is a total continuum, but for the for explanatory purposes, we could divide it up into three sections: the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the superconscious mind. Now, you might well know the workings of the conscious mind. The conscious mind is a sector, a very small sector of the mind governed or portrayed through what we call the brain, which is but an organ. I said in a talk not too long ago that the brain, a two and a half to three pound organ, contains two billion cells, and we are only using one millionth of the 12 billion cells, not two, 12. You're using one millionth of the 12 billion cells. So from that, we could gauge how small the conscious mind is, which in turn governs our senses, hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling. So these senses have their uh, center of cognition in the conscious level of the mind. So if you hear uh, something, uh, it is not the ears that hear it, the ears are but just organs. That sound goes through to the particular center in the conscious level of the brain where it would recognize it to be a sound. And most of you must have experienced this, that you are absorbed in doing something, say reading a book, and the doorbell rings, and yet you do not hear the doorbell. Hmm? Most of you have experienced this. So the ear was there, the conscious center was there, right, and yet you did not hear, hear it. So this means that the conscious level of the mind is not enough to make you hear. You still have to go to a deeper layer of the mind, which one could call the intellect, and that intellect weighs up the matter, did I hear a sound or not? It weighs up the quality of the sound. Was it the bell ringing or was it a knock? And in this weighing process, it does not end. It still goes further after it has made its judgment that it was a bell the electrical bell or a knock, it still goes further. Hmm? For the intellect itself cannot judge, it can only weigh. And the weight goes further to another layer within the subconscious level of the mind, to a final layer of the subconscious, there it, that very thought gets energized and acceptance takes place upon the judgment of the conscious mind and conveyed back through the same area to the intellect, then through the various brain cells, and that cognizes that I've heard a knock. Good. So the conscious mind performs a very small function in man. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is said that even a genius like Einstein, by the way, I only know two kinds of people, geniuses and geniuses. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is said that Einstein only used about 8% of his brain. Mm -hmm. The rest is lying dormant. Through spiritual practices and meditation, you awaken more and more cells in your brain so that more and more of the mind could filter through. Now, in reality, in actuality, there is only one mind. 
There are no two minds. There are no individual minds at all. There is only one universal mind, which is the first manifestation of the manifesta. But why do you find individual minds? Individual minds are found, uh, and to put it in a form of analogy, are like bubbles on a pond. Can the bubble be separated from the pond? It is made of the substance of the pond and the various air currents, etc., which are in the pond brings it up as a bubble, but just to burst again and become the pond again. Can one separate a wave from the sea? You can't. Hmm? For once the wave subsides, it is still the sea. So, there is only one mind, and because of the subconscious mind that the individualization takes place. Now, the question would arise, what is the subconscious mind? Modern psychologists and psychiatrists who consult me on many of their cases, they call me in as a consultant, uh, know very little of the subconscious mind. Hmm? They've just about dipped their toes in this vast ocean hmm, of the mind. The subconscious mind is nothing else but thought formations. Hmm? Where do these thoughts come from? Good. Since the Big Bang, or the start of the present cycle of the universe, when you started off your evolutionary progress and was forced into this momentum, this propulsion, which in other words is called evolution, and from that sub, 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 subatomic particle, which has been crystallized from the primal manifestation which we have called mind, it through various stages of mineral and plant and animal reached the stage of man. And yet there are still other stages on other planets which go beyond the stage of man. For man, in his present state of evolution, has reached only a certain height. 99.999% of the world's population are insane. Cuckoo. (laughs) Only that fraction of a percent is sane. The totally integrated man is sane. And if you are not totally integrated, then you can't be sane. Like a friend of mine said to me the other day, oh, the lady just can't be a little pregnant. Hmm? You see, so now we are busy on the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is nothing but composed of thought forms. These thought forms, since you began, since you became individualized, other individual atoms mixed with you, the little atom or sub, 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 subatomic particle, and it also had the quality of duplicating itself and replicating itself until it reached the stage of the amoebic stage, uh, the f- first cell, and from there on, this, that cell too replicated, and this is how the whole universe came about. Right. Now, your subconscious mind is a storehouse of memories, and everything that is that had happened since the Big Bang millions and millions of years ago, all that memory is stored in this little head of ours, which can be recalled at will. Now, our experiences might have been pleasant experiences, so they are pleasant memories. 
experiences might have been unpleasant, so they are they are unpleasant memories. Now, everything in this world or in the universe is forever finding expression. As I always say, the flower finds expression in the fragrance it exudes. The sun finds expression in the heat and light it gives off. Everything wants to express itself. Now, which is the easiest way for the subconscious to express itself? Because the subconscious mind is made up of thoughts, as I said, and thoughts are patterned. They are patternings of thoughts. So the patterning of the thoughts get conveyed in its expression to the conscious mind, and the conscious mind puts it into action through your five senses and through the limbs of your body. Fine. So, the process is this, to find great peace, to find the peace that passeth all understanding, is how to overcome, hmm? how to overcome all the patternings that lie there in the subconscious mind. Now, this might take lifetimes to do, Mm. 200, 200 million lifetimes to unpattern all those patternings. Mm. So man goes on suffering while his real true nature is one of total bliss, for divinity is bliss. Yet there's one factor not recognized uh, by modern, modern medicine, modern psychology or psychiatry. I remember about two years ago, I was invited to speak at a seminar in Las Vegas on holistic health. So we had physicians there and psychiatrists and various members of the medical fraternity. And of course, I spoke from the mystical and spiritual angle. And I told them that the body, the mind, and the spirit within man is a continuum so when you speak of holistic health, people must be treated wholly and not partially. Today, because of specialization, a physician will only look at the physiology or the, or the body. Uh, the psychiatrist will only think of the mind. Mm. And of course, the church ministers are wasting their time, mostly. <laughs> I had uh, to give you an example. I had, uh, I had a... Uh, press conference in London not so long ago and of course various newspapers were invited to this hotel by the organizers and, and, and I told them that look I have not come to empty the churches I've come to fill the churches the synagogues and the mosques and the temples but firstly if the priest can't give you anything then naturally people don't go there like it reminds me uh, of this man who went to a doctor uh, and he's complaining or he says, doctor, um, I snore when I sleep. So um, the doctor says, does it disturb your wife? So he says, oh, not only my wife, it disturbs the whole congregation. <laughs> nice place to go to sleep, by the way. <laughs> you end up there in very, very deep sleep too. Hmm? And from there, direct to the cemetery. Yeah. Yes. Right. So I tell them that we want to fill the churches and synagogues and temples. But the way to do it is this, that every church minister, pastor, whatever you want to call him, must during his years he, spend, he spends in a seminary. It's funny that word, seminary, when many... Priests are supposed, supposed to be celibates. <clears throat> I tell you, with me, it's not only wisdom, but it'll find a lot of fun as well. Right. Um, 
So this is why I told them that while going through the period of studying theology, they must be put through a period of intense meditation where they themselves are led from fragmentation to integration. And it's only through this integration within themselves that they could impart something to the people that come to church. Hmm? People don't want to listen to empty sermons. Hmm? Well, they could be very, very parrot-like. But if, if the priest or the pastor, minister, could really impart a spiritual flow. For example, I'm speaking to you, you are not only hearing my words, but through the voice I'm also imparting to you a certain spiritual force. So therefore, uh, I can promise you one thing. When these two days are over, you'd never be the same person again. That's for sure. Um, that's besides the point. So the subconscious mind is a repository of all those things that have happened to you, all those experiences, and the experiences live in the subconscious mind as impressions. The word for impressions in Sanskrit is sanskaras. Hmm? So your entire lifestyle is guided by your sanskaras. In other words, you are today the sum totality of what you have been before in other lifetimes, if you believe in that. Hmm? You are the sum totality. You do not recall those lifetimes because most people dwell just on the surface level of the mind, the conscious mind. But through spiritual practices, when you dive deeper and deeper to the various layers of the subconscious mind, you can recall your past lives, you can bring forth all those memories hmm? that had all the things that had happened to you which left those impressions. But I still tell you that God's greatest gift to man is that is forgetfulness. Because if you could remember all the things you've done in the past, Mm, my life could become intolerable. Mm. There was this one lady who came into great wealth, mm, but she wanted a tight title, an English lady. She wanted a title you know, no, for, of nobility, so she could be known as Lady So-and-so. So she wrote to this firm that specializes in going into ancestry, and this firm went into the subject and found that her great-grandfather was electrocuted for committing a heinous crime. Mm, must have killed someone, so he got electrocuted. But these people felt, now how shall we reply to this lady because they charge big fees. We like to keep the customers happy. Huh. That's how business thrive. So they wrote back that uh, your great-grandfather, Mr. John Parkinson, left his body while occupying the chair of applied electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could remember all the happenings of our past lives, life would become intolerable. Not that the function of the subconscious is dormant. We're still coming to the superconscious. <laughs> right. Uh, not that the functionings of the subconscious is dormant, it's working on all the time. When you sleep, the conscious mind um, might sleep or get blocked off, but the subconscious mind is still working and the very patternings in the subconscious is the substance of your dreams. And thank God you have dreams. Hmm? There are many people have nightmares and I say, please have more nightmares. Yes, because that is a mechanism, a release valve, that if you had to live those nightmares in the waking state of life, life would become H-E-L-L. -L. 
Hmm? Yes, sir. So now, all these patternings are there. What is man to do about it? He wants to find peace in this life. Hmm? We want peace in this life. We don't want to wait for 200 million lifetimes to find peace. What can we do? Hmm? Ah, here is where meditation and specialized spiritual practices come in. That in spite of the cloudedness of the subconscious mind, there exists a direct line from the conscious mind to the super-conscious level of the mind. Fine. And one can bypass or bore through the wall of those thought patternings hmm? who has no real existence of its own. Remember, it has no real ex existence of its own because it is dependent upon spiritual energy. Fine. So, through systematic meditation, one leads the conscious mind through directly through the subconscious areas of the mind in spite of all the patternings that are there and reaches the super conscious level of the mind. Now, what is the superconscious level? That's a term um, which I've used for many, many years. Perhaps I might have been one of the first to formulate that term. Now, the, the entire mind, being the primal manifestation, falls uh, in relativity. It is not absolute. But at that superconscious level, it is at its finest level that the mind could ever achieve. So the mind causes a lot of trouble for us. Hmm? All our miseries and sufferings are caused by the mind. And at the same time, the mind can be used as a tool to bring joy and happiness in our lives. If you could picture to yourself um, a vast board, vast board, have a dark blue color at the one end and then fade it out into a finer and finer and finer and finer blue until you reach the finest blue. The finest blue you could regard to be the super conscious level of the mind, while the very dark blue is the conscious level of the mind. So, through certain practices, you go right through and reach the super conscious level where although there is motion because mind cannot exist without motion but the motion seems as if it's totally still it's like a top the children that play tops. You spin it, and when it's at a high speed, you think it is standing still, and yet filled with the greatest amount of motion. So at that level, one finds that stillness. It is at that level where the biblical injunction is properly understood that be still and know that I am God. Fine. So through a systematic, scientific manner, we reach the superconscious level of the mind. And being like a clear pane of glass, you'd find the light of the absolute shining through. Mm -hmm. And when it shines through, it goes through that channel that you've created through the subconscious mind and the light being so powerful, it banishes the darkness of the subconscious mind. And when the darkness is banished there, that light comes through to the conscious level of the mind, which uh, influences uh, action and reaction and makes us act in the right proper way very, very spontaneously. In other words, you do not need to force yourself to do a certain action. 
for forcing yourself to do a certain action could create a lot of repressions and inhibitions in your subconscious mind. What you would end up doing is just shifting around energies and not dissolving the energies. The whole purpose of spiritual practices is to dissolve those negative energies that are in the mind and give greater force and power to the positive energies. Hmm? Now, for example, a chap like Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, you've heard his name, most of you. Hmm? I've said this a few times before that I would challenge him on any public platform that, that he says, if you have a negative thought, uh, you change it over into a positive thought. And that is impossible. It can't be done. It is not an electric switch where you just switch on the light and switch off the light. Maybe if the mind is bothered, you're so emotionally involved in a negative thought, how can you just flip it over into a positive thought? No. The process, which I would tell Norman Vincent Peale, is this, that you take the negative thought and neutralize it through a spiritual practice which just takes but a few moments to neutralize, and then you introduce the positive thought. Hmm? It's like tilling a field. If the field is full of weeds and it's not well plowed, the seed you plant of positive thought won't grow. You've got to apply it, in other words, neutralize. Mm. And then you plant the seed and the beautiful flower would grow. You see. What is the nature of the superconscious mind? Mm. The superconscious mind being of the finest point of relativity, being the finest in the relative existence, is the purest and free from thought. Mm. Thought patterns only begin from the subconscious down to the conscious and then in action. But the superconscious mind, although it is still in the relative, is totally devoid of thought. Mm. So it is not affected at all. Mm. And thoughts are things. You could actually see thoughts. Mm. If you have uh, developed certain abilities and through spiritual practices, you develop these abilities, but of course you don't take notice of them because I would discourage any of the, any psychic phenomena because it only tends to drive you crazy. You, you might have read a book, um, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, and they, they give you a story of a woman who could shift the, the yellow and the white from an egg just by thought force. But she's such a nervous wreck, the book goes on to tell you. So it's not worth it. And you get stuck in, in the psychic things. Your, your path is to become one with divinity. Your path, your goal in life is to go from diversity into unity, where you develop unity consciousness. That's a different subject. We'll speak about that in this next two days, what the unity consciousness is all about and what is consciousness. Remind me to speak about it, I'll speak about it. Good. So, at that level, you find that stillness without any thought. So, when you approach that stillness, you do not come back empty-handed. Hmm? You bring that stillness through the subconscious layers of the mind, brightening it, banishing the darkness there, and then bring it to the conscious mind so that your senses feel the power of this light. Your emotions get governed by this light. People say, annihilate the ego. You can't, it is impossible. You cannot annihilate, annihilate the ego, but you can, like a piece of rubber, if we compare the ego to a piece of rubber, you can pull it Mm? so that it becomes transparent and loses its opaqueness 
and by becoming transparent for that effulgent, indefinable, ineffable light of divinity shines through and experience the peace that passeth all understanding. For the mind itself, being so limited, finite, could never have any idea or explore the totality of that which is infinite. But the infinite can be experienced. So on the experiential level, you know what they call God to be all about. Because God, Allah, uh, eternal, infinite, hmm? these are all labels. Energy, divine energy. You can use any label you like. Labels does not matter. You can wear a blue suit or a green suit or a sky blue pink suit. You still John or Jack or, or James. Hmm? Good. So labels do not matter. But you reach, by reaching the superconscious level of the mind, you reach the totality of the mind. And from that vantage point, you see the workings of the subconscious, not only on the individual basis, but you see the entirety of the universe, for the mind is as vast as the universe, and there is only one mind and all these little galaxies and solar systems and suns and all that which you see are just but bubbles at this very moment there are millions of universes uh, galaxies exploding at this very moment there are millions of them being recreated being pushed out of the black hole where another universe is being formed and formulated to progress on again mm, until it reaches the black hole and gets sucked in mm, from one side and after a while when the vibrations become more faster and faster and faster it explodes to recreate another another galaxy or universe you see so when one through spiritual practices approaches this very fine level of the mind you can know the entire universe tomorrow evening i will be going into a state of meditation which in sanskrit is called nirvikalpa samadhi you might have heard that term Mm -hmm. You have Sarvikalpa Samadhi, which meditation with form, and Nirvikalpa Samadhi means meditation without form. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, that's set for tomorrow evening. Um, well, other practices and things we'll do during the day, but that is specially set for tomorrow evening, where you will just sit back and relax, and I will go into meditation, and you will go through experiences. Hmm? of a power, a force that is far greater than what we think in terms of just this body and our senses and our limbs. So there is a power far greater and you actually experience it because with me going into the nirvikalpa state, uh, I bring back that divine force which you tangibly feel and experience in particular ways. I don't want to tell you what you would experience because I don't influence your mind. You experience, then you tell me what you've experienced. That's it for tomorrow evening. So, man has the ability to have eternity. Hmm? What did the poet Blake say? Eternity in an hour? I think he was wrong. Eternity in a moment, that's what I say. Why take a whole hour? Huh? In a moment. You see. And this can be achieved and meditation. Look, this is no this is not a selling process. It's a non profit making organization. I travel around the world. Hmm? And uh, uh, the for example the Canadian Meditation Society just provided the FA for me to come here. And uh, I go around the world that way, teaching, teaching, teaching. Mm. Then new people might say, how do you make a living? I say, well, sort of gifts and donations which friends give or don't give. One day it's a piece of dry bread. Next day, perhaps, there might be a little butter. But to me, it doesn't matter. Mm. I see. 
So when you reach that vantage point of the superconscious level of the mind, then you are in the area of knowingness. You know within your soul. Hmm? You know that you are divine. You do not need to think that you are divine because your thought is very, very limited. As I said, using one millionth of 12 billion cells in the brain. So how much can your thought be? But man has the ability to grasp, embrace the entire universe in his hands, in his arms. And then man can start realizing that unity, that the entire universe and I are but one. There is no division, there are no boundaries, there's no separations. And these separations we feel or think about are only creations of these thoughts and thoughts Hmm? not well regulated and running around at random like a, a rudderless boat does not find its proper direction. Hmm? It drifts along in the ocean of life purposelessly, yet life itself is a purpose. Huh? and we don't use it, and then we say, oh Lord, I'm suffering, suffering, why are you so unjust? Uh, you have some trouble, you blame the children, then you blame the poor wife, uh, then you blame the boss, and if that doesn't help, you blame the guru, and if that still doesn't work, you blame God. Hmm? And that divine power has nothing, has nothing to do with it. That divine force is a neutral force, and you could use it any way you like. Like electricity, put it into a, a, a stove, you'll have heat. Put it into a refrigerator, you, you'd have coal. It's still the same electricity. It's a neutral force. And how we apply this neutral force, that constitutes our free will, how to com combine free will with divine will until you even transcend all that and know that I am that I am. Hmm? Otherwise, when you reach that stage, the rest becomes baloney. <laughs> you know, this young man and, and his girlfriend went for a drive somewhere here in Vancouver, up one of those mountains. Now, I believe there's a point there called Echo Point. Hmm? So uh, she tells him, he says, why didn't you try it? He says, oh, that's silly, it's for children. She says, come on, try it. So he shouts, baloney. No reply. No echo. So then she says, let's try again. Then he shouted again, I'm the handsomest man in the world. And there the reply came, baloney. <laughs> Dear me. Mm. You see, many of these teachings have been so watered down. There was this Mullah Nasruddin, so a friend of his brought him uh, a whole lot of vegetables. So this mullah thought, what must I do with them? So he thought, let me make a nice pot of soup. Mm. So he made a nice pot of soup. And then after all, he had some of the soup. He was hungry, it was nearly this time. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and then uh, there was a knock on the door. And the person says, I'm the friend, you know, of the man who brought you the vegetables. So, Mula, it's an Eastern custom. Someone comes and visits your home. You always offer something. You don't let him go back empty-handed. Offer him tea, coffee, whatever, scotch, whatever. <laughs> right. So, um, then another knock came on the door. And uh, this person said that I'm the friend of the friend of the man who brought you the vegetables. He says, come in, sir, gave him a bowl of soup. And then after a while, another knock came, third knock, fourth knock, fifth knock. And uh, the fifth knock, the fellow says, I'm the friend of 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 the friend who brought you the vegetables. Come in, sir. Meanwhile, the soup was getting less. Hmm? And so this mullah, he kept on adding a bit of water to it. Hmm? 
Yeah, so then the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth knock came on the door, and this time the chap says, "Look, I'm the friend of 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 the friend who brought you the vegetables." So he says, "Mula, please come in," and he gave him a bowl of soup. So this chap starts eating, and he says, "He says, Mula, this is not soup. This is water." So the mula says, "Look." Seeing that you're the friend of 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 the friend, this is the soup of 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 the soup. That is how all these ancient truths have been watered down, where all the soup is gone, and only water is left. The beautiful birds of love. Have but flown away, and only the droppings are left. <laughs> you know, we are we are all good people, like this boy. He says to his dad, "He says, Dad, I'll be good today if you give me a dollar." Where's that fellow? No, I don't see him. But well, he says, "Dad, uh, um, he says, Dad, I'll be good today if you give me a dollar." So he says, so the father says, "Oh, what's become? What's coming of this generation?" He says, "When I was your age, I was good for nothing." <laughs> <laughs> You know, on this, uh, we have time for one more joke. <laughs> uh, let's see, what one? Ah, there was this beautiful luncheon, you know, an, uh, of some embassy, an ambassadorial luncheon. So uh, these dignitaries were invited at this luncheon, and there was a venerable Chinese gentleman, very well dressed. Belonging to the diplomatic corps, and next to him sat a young Englishman, and um, who wanted to start up a conversation. You sit next to someone at a dinner table and start chatting. Fine. And so um, when the soup was served, uh, the Englishman asked the China, Chinese gentleman, "Likey soupy?" So the Chinese gentleman just smiled, you know. So the Englishman thought, "Oh well, perhaps he doesn't understand English at all." So after the dinner was over, hmm, uh, at such functions, I've been to many of them myself, so I know. We uh, normally ask people to stand up and give a little speech, and so a few speeches were given, and then came the turn turn of the Chinese gentleman. So the Chinese gentleman got up. And he gave a little speech, full of wit and wisdom, and in, and in impeccable English. Hmm? So, as he was sitting down amidst the applause, he asks this English gentleman, "You likey speechy?" <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> that brings us now to lunchtime, and we'll be getting together this afternoon. So, Hugh, would you please make any announcements? What time? And I know it's the same place. Yeah, yeah that's of course true. Mm. Every another chance and the meditation at three o'clock. Uh, between the end of your lunch and three o'clock, we hope that we can set up the uh, television so that we can do one of our video tapes from our course in Vancouver. Last week, so those of you who uh, lack a conventional lunch hour can uh, sit here and watch television and have, I would think, uh, a lovely bonus to the course, namely one of our satsang, the Guruji and Anchor you we see last week. Mm -hmm. so that's the, I believe that there's a cafeteria quite close by, which Larry could probably point you in the right direction. What time do you should be back in satsang? Well, um, that's an excellent question. I would say um, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Two o'clock? Exactly. If, if you like, it's hour and a half. If you want it longer, perhaps it's actually yours. Uh, didn't you say three o'clock for the, the chant and the meditation? Yes, but it's flexible, of course. All right, so we're flexible now.
Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be here. Really? Uh, I'll be here before four. I think I'll go with Barbara. Right. Right. Um, and, um, and then from four, you'll be finished with the chanting and, yeah. and meditation by that time. And then, then we'll have a two hour session, one hour a talk on any subject you like. And the other hour would go in a rapid fire question and answer. We can ask about anything you like. All right. So that will bring us to six then, I think.